We all know relationships are crucial to the success of any business, but sometimes those relationships can become a major catalyst for growth. That's what happened in my partnership with the incredible team at My Utilities. What started as a valuable free service for my clients turned into some of the most important business relationships and friendships that I have. I was able to give time back to my clients during one of the most stressful and taxing seasons of their life by providing them a better way to do something they were already going to do. My Utilities will research and provide your clients with all of the options and best deals from the providers available in their area and then set up whatever your client chooses for free. Plus, they're the most reviewed company of their type with over 3,300 reviews and are also the most highly reviewed with an average of 4.9 out of 5 stars. In a market environment where clients have lots of lenders to choose from, adding even more value and providing an outstanding client experience may just be what tips the scales in your favor. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about how you can partner with My Utilities. Welcome to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast, where expert guests teach you how to have success in the mortgage and real estate industry. Here's your host, Phil Treadwell. All right, welcome back to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Treadwell. Our mortgage marketing expert today is Tim Brahim. This is a good friend of mine and, and coach. He is the head coach of Performance Experts. He's the creator of the Leadership 360 Coaching Program, as well as host of the 360 Experience Podcast. He's one of only eight mortgage originators that have been inducted into the Mortgage Originator Magazine's Hall of Fame. He's a successful entrepreneur that's exited several companies, including one of my personal favorites, which is LoanToolbox.com, that reached over 11,000 loan originators. So this guy's no joke. And if there was a Mount Rushmore of mortgage professionals, this guy would definitely be on it. Tim, welcome back to the podcast, my friend. Phil, thank you very much. I'm I'm chuckling for a couple of things you said. The first thing is, is well, I, I won't touch one of them because we don't know each other quite well enough. I'll just skirt <laughs> that one. But the Mortgage Originator Magazine one, we probably need to yank that from my bio. I don't think anybody even knows what that is anymore. They went, they went out of business in like 2008. <laughs> so, all right. Hey, all, the, all that means is that no one else can get added and it makes it that much more prestigious. Yes. That's all that means. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of exclusivity and scarcity in that equation for sure. Right on. Well, man, you've been on the podcast a couple of times. You were one of our original inaugural episodes that we released the podcast with, one of our top 10 most downloaded, as well as you came back and, and you and Barry Habib uh, did a, an episode that is actually number two on most downloaded episodes ever, second to only Gary V. And, and he's obviously a, a huge personality. You offer so much value. And so I'm so excited to have you on. And so everybody that's listening just needs to know we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff here. I don't even know exactly what we're going to cover, but I know it's going to be good. So so definitely buckle up. Tim, I, I want to jump in and just have uh, you kind of talk about right now what you're passionate about in this industry, because you coach and collaborate with some of the best of the best in our industry from other entrepreneurs and business owners that have platforms that support the industry, as well as originators that are absolutely crushing it in any market. So I just love to kind of hear from you. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? What are you really focused on right now with the industry the way it is right now? Ooh, we could take the whole call talking about that. So, wow, Phil, first of all, this is a market that is very deja vu for me. The types of things that I'm coaching my clients on right now are things that maybe haven't even been discussed for 15 to 20 years. Everything from how to truly be like we, we love to talk, Phil, about the concept of being a strategic partner to our realtors, right? But what does partnership really look like? I mean, and, and right now is a time where that's a, that's a critical definition and one that, that every originator needs to understand fully and then deliver on because they really need it. Realtors really need help right now. And so we've been working a lot on that. Uh, you mentioned Barry. We've been working with Barry. My, when I say we, I'm talking about my the Leadership 360 family, my clients. Uh, we've been working with Barry very intimately and very successfully. Barry is really, I mean, wow, he's been so incredibly valuable and helpful to people right now. And thank God for him. Mindset is another thing, bro, that's like super vital right now. I mean, really since probably September is when we've been really focused on on really getting our head right, staying clear on the ob objective. You know, it's a market where yeah, the problem, Phil, as you know, with 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 the previous decade is, is just a, so much immediate gratification, right? Like, I mean, if you do certain things, you get certain results. We become very 
spoiled or, you know, I mean, how many loans did you lock this week? You know, 17, you know, I mean, I, mean, I have clients who talk to and they'd lock nine loans a day, eight loans, seven, 12, whatever. I mean, just now it's like if I locked five or six this month, it's, it's actually weathering the storm. Now that's not to say that all originators that I work with are down to that number. Some are, I still have originators who are doing 30, 40, you know, transactions a month right now, especially in the South. The South seems to be the hot market. There's more affordability there and, and more inventory. But I think that the originators that have the relationships right now, Phil, are the ones that are still doing well. And, and it's a lesson to be learned, you know, like if you didn't do the things that you needed to do during the good times, which is fortify relationships, really have a database management strategy, create great customer intimacy, then right now you're exposed, right? Because you're having to scramble and, and get back to that. The last thing that I'll say, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you and then we can drill down on anything you want, is it's in markets like this that you have a tremendous opportunity to strategically execute on the things that you always wanted to execute on, but you never had the time to because it was so busy. And I look back on my career as an originator and the two things that I was known for were database management and the perfect loan process. Well, my database management strategy was developed, Phil, in 1994, you know, my third two and a half years into the business. And it was, that was a tremendously difficult time, 1994. I mean, nine and three quarters percent on a 30 year fixed. And I lived in the San Fernando Valley and there was a 6.7 earthquake in January of 94 and half the houses were red tagged and I didn't have much to do during the day. So I developed a prolific database nurturing system. And then in 99, when rates were at like eight and a half, eight and three quarters is when I developed the perfect loan process. So what I would offer is what is it that you have always wanted to work on that you know you need to do and using this time wisely to create the structure around something that will separate you from your competition. So going forward, you're going to be armed and dangerous and, and you have the time to do it. So I really, really passionately recommend you do. It's so good. A common theme in there that you've kind of talked about is both relationships and time. We have a little more time. We have a little more bandwidth because we're not as busy and we know that relationships are more important. And one of the things that I've quoted several times in some of our, our social media posts that you had said in a previous episode is that business with realtors is about relationships and most originators just don't give it enough time. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about what that should look like, because right now we have a lot of people that are not only impatient, but are trying to sell themselves to a realtor in one coffee appointment or one phone call, and they're not understanding what it takes to develop that relationship in, a, in the right way, because they're they're constantly wanting something, which leads to another thing that you said is no one reciprocates with takers. And I'd love you to kind of unpack that because I think it's more applicable now than it even was then, because we have so many loan officers trying to go get realtor business or other referral partner type business. And they're going about this relationship thing the wrong way in a lot of cases. Wow. Thanks for that softball. You just threw me. Uh, <laughs> we can definitely go here. All right. Let's break it down because I think there are several components to that. So let's just start with the term. You know, we, I, I like to just say, look, referral partner relationships, remove the first two words, relationships. Let's, let's not complicate this. What is a relationship? Well, what are the hallmarks of a relationship? Any relationship that you have, Phil, or any that our listeners have is they're founded on common denominators. They're founded on trust. They're founded on some time to build that trust, right? Like, I mean, they, they, you know, any relationship that you have meaning in your life, any of your close friends, it didn't, you didn't become their close friend after one beer, you know, you became their close friend over sharing occurrences with them and you had things in common with them and that you displayed that you were friend worthy. Okay. And, and as a result of that display of friend worthiness, a relationship just naturally blossomed. Now, when we look at how most originators pursue referral partners, they start off with their agenda, which is to try to get that person to send business to them. And that's the mistake. So it, it starts right there and ends right there. What if it were not about you trying to do anything? What if it were about you only understanding what need this person might have and how you might be able to help them? 
I guarantee you, if you, I would love to do like a test with somebody on this. If you would have started off this year, Phil, and you had one goal in your business plan, just one, and the goal was to connect with 100 people this year, like truly connect, like get to know them, understand who they were, be present with them, ask them a lot of questions about themselves and see how you could serve them in some way. Like it could be just an introduction to somebody else that you know that they may need in their life, or it could be sharing a laugh, you know, like laughter is a virtue, man, especially in this world that we're in right now where things are so intense. It could be actually understanding what they need in their business and helping them with it. I mean, there are a myriad of different things, but I would be really interested to see what would happen to that originator in the five years after that in terms of their business, if they had that as their only goal. So I like to use the metaphor of dating. I've heard others use that metaphor. I've been using it for 20 years, but it's, it's a great metaphor. Pardon the somewhat crudeness of what I'm about to say, but like if you go out on the first date and you're expecting sex on the first date, probably not going to be a long-term relationship, right? <laughs> right? Because you're, you're, you're kind of jumping the gun a little bit. You don't even know if you like this person and you're just wanting something for you. It's a very self-serving experience. All great relationships that we've had in our life took time and had a mutual reciprocity in the equation. And what I would offer is that any good referral partner relationship starts with giving. And I think that in order to understand what is it that I want to give somebody, you have to be patient enough to take the time to get to know that person's needs and ask a lot of open-ended questions, which I'll get to that in a moment in terms of what an open-ended question is versus a closed-ended question. But let's go to a slightly different topic tied into the same thing. To know what their needs are is to, in part, know how they're compensated. So a real estate agent, as an example, is compensated very transactionally. They get paid a lot of money up front, and the potentiality for repeat customer business is not anywhere near as short term as it would be for an originator who could get a refi and things like that. So they get a lot of money up front. They're going to be caring about one thing, which is, can you get this deal done and protect my paycheck? Because it's a lot of money on the line, which in a crazy busy market like 2020, 2021, that's like, how good was your system of facilitating loans and communication and customer service, i.e. the perfect loan process? That would be the sell then. What's the sell now? Pretty simple. How can you convince, not unethically, not unethically, underscored, but how can you convince or help someone see that right now is a good time to write an offer on a home? How can you help someone see that right now is a good time to list their home because we have an inventory shortage. Now you're speaking to their greatest need and how they are compensated. But that comes with understanding who they are and getting to know them better. CPA, CFP, totally different. They get paid annually or in the case of a CFP, maybe even quarterly based upon assets under management. So they're very relational in their thought process. So how you would want to speak to them would be very different, would be like, I understand the value of upholding your reputation. I understand the value of making sure that we create a, a fence around you so your clients aren't getting their mortgage with Wells Fargo and then depositing their assets with Wells Fargo and you're losing their asset base. Totally different approach. So the best loan originators right now are utilizing market data and product knowledge to educate real estate agents on how they can help them by having conversations with their potential buyers and if they would like with the clients that they have that are pondering listing and helping them understand why now is still a good time to list your home for sale potentially. I, I love what you're saying there because it's 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 a kind of a two-pronged approach here. One is you need to take time and develop a relationship and let them know who you are, not just what you do. And when it's appropriate, you're adding value in a way that's applicable to them. Too often, it seems to me, a lot of originators have a set script or a set 
value offer that they have to any partner and they take that into relationships before really understanding what you talked about, which is how do they compensated? What is their need from a business perspective? And I love the example that you used of a CPA, a CFP and a realtor. All three of those have different relationships as far as revenue generating relationships because they don't get paid the same. They're paid in not as transactionally as a realtor is, for, for example. So then taking some values, taking some information and helping them move that specific needle. And so to kind of segue back into where I think we're going in the conversation is what does that look like? What kind of questions do you need to ask? What are those tactical steps in the relationship that you can take so that you develop one for the long term and, and not in the metaphor that was used, the kind of one time hit it and quit it? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of saying it. That's a little bit more PC. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is that before we get to the, what the difference is between closed-ended questions and open-ended questions, I, I just really want to reemphasize something. Like this whole notion about going in with a strategy and a plan—that's the trap. I mean, that's that's the critical failure point. Is it's first of all, it's number one, it's too much pressure on you. And when you're under pressure as a salesperson, you're not the best version of yourself. You know, needy is creepy. If you're acting like you need them, you're not attractive. Let's go back to dating. So oftentimes you, you'll see like a, a couple walking down the street, one person's super attractive and the other one, you're kind of like, wow, how did she get him or how did he get her? Well, I guarantee it wasn't because they called four times a day chasing, you know, it's because there's an internal confidence that's attractive in that individual. And that's a very important thing to understand. So going into the appointment with a true curiosity about this person and how you might be able to help them. And if they might even, whether they're going to be a good fit to work with you or not, you're interviewing them for the opportunity to work with you every bit as much as the antithesis. But we get so scarcity based. So we go in in this insecure place of having to rush and try to close. And then when we don't close, we get frustrated. And then we go back and we try to rework the strategy. Can you see the trap? It's like you're, you're totally off in a different realm of the one that you should be in, which is, hey, I'm just going in to be me and to connect and to be a friend and to help. And I trust that if I keep doing that over and over with as many people as I can, there will be relationships that will be forged that will be very meaningful for me. I'm not saying go in and, and not know what your value proposition is. That's not what right. I'm saying. I'm not saying, I mean, right now is the time where understanding the financial markets, as I said, and product is critical. Why? Not just because it will give you bows in your quiver to be able to, to hit the bullseye with when, when you have an opportunity structure a tough deal that 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 wins favor but also more importantly because you then walk in with confidence right because you know you're good you know that if you walk in you know that you don't know shit i mean you're gonna you're gonna be a much lesser version of yourself so walking in with confidence and truly not like i would strongly recommend you're not trying to under any circumstances get the person to send business to you for at least two appointments Try that on and see what happens. My experience was as soon as I shifted the paradigm to that, all of a sudden people started chasing me. I have a client by the name of Greg Kingsbury who has 16 incredible loyal realtors. How loyal? Here's how loyal, Phil. When they give out a card, this is what they say, some version of this. Here's my lender's card. His name is Greg Kingsbury. I want you to call him and work with him. If you choose to work with somebody else, I want you to know that I'm not responsible for what the results are. How's that for a great referral? That's a great referral. How did it happen? Same approach. Greg, Greg never talks about himself for at least two appointments. Two full appointments, never about him, only about them. So, and Mike Watson from Benchmark, top producer from Benchmark, same approach. Those guys are like identical twins, even though they look nothing alike. They do business exactly the same way. They both have a huge realtor base because they developed true relationships with patience and deep connection. So closed-ended questions, open-ended questions. Very, very important that you understand the psychology of this. So a closed-ended question might sound something like, is the market tough for you right now? An open-ended question may sound something like, what are some of the challenges that you're experiencing right now that I might be able to help you with? What's the difference between the two? 
a closed-ended question elicits a very specific finite yes or no response in most cases. Yeah, it's tough right now. An open-ended question gets the person to talk and as a result of talking gets them to feel and gets them to divulge to you where they have needs and pains that you might be able to help them with. You know, Barbara Walters, dating myself now, you know, she's, but she is one of the greatest interview journalists of all time, once famously said, the art of an interview, which is what we're talking about here, of getting to know somebody, is not the question that you ask. It's the question that you ask of the answer that they gave you to the initial question that you asked. So peeling the layer of the onion back a little bit further. So the person responds back, Phil says, oh man, you know, I can't get, we don't have any inventory and I have all these buyers and, you know, I can't get anybody to move forward. Everybody's looking at the media and they're worried about, you know, a financial crisis and wow, Matt, yeah, I hear you. I really hear you. And let me ask you this, what, what are you currently doing to help re-educate them and to have them understand that that's fear that they're being sold and that there are tremendous buying opportunities right now, especially with unique loan products that can be of service to them. Boom. Okay. So now they're going to explain more. The current lender that you're working with, tell me a little bit about how they're working with the, with your clients to help them understand that this is probably short-term money that they're going to be borrowing because we're surely going to see this economy and this inflationary pressure slow down as a result of the Fed rate hikes. And it's incumbent upon any mortgage professional right now to really educate the consumer on that. Can you see where this ends up automatically evolving into a meaningful conversation where you can display some wisdom, but more importantly, you can get them to feel the pain of their current circumstances and then can be there to help solve the pain. Yes. That's so good. Getting someone to feel something is a very easy way to make sure that they remember the conversation. And another thing that I love so much in that is that most people walk away from conversations with people feeling good about it when they were the one that did the most talking. Bingo. Grand slam. Listen, the first time that I ever did this, tell you where I was. I could tell you who I was with. I was with a lady by the name of Kathy McLean. She was a super hot top end producer, very intimidating to me. Her and her husband, Bob did nothing but big properties in Lake Sherwood. And I said, you know what, this shit isn't working anymore for me. I'm going to try a different approach. I'm not going to talk about me. I'm not going to talk about who they're currently working with. I'm not going to do any of that stuff that everybody keeps telling me I need to do. I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to ask questions and get to know them. Took out a yellow legal pad like this, brought it into her office, sat there and literally just asked a lot of meaningful open-ended questions. 30 minutes go by. I get to the point where it's getting close to the time because I asked for a 30 minute conversation. I said, gosh, I'm looking at my watch and I can't believe how fast the time's gone by, Kathy. It's been really nice to get to know you. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I really appreciate you. You know, oh, no, no, no. Let's, let's keep talking. Let's, we, I have more time. All of a sudden she had more time. Why? Because people like to talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. People like, it goes deeper than that. It's not as much, they do like to talk about themselves, Phil, but let's get to the true psychology of it. At the end of the day, what do you want? What do I want? What does everybody listening to this show want? We want to feel liked and seen, period. It's a fundamental human need that goes all the way back to our childhood. When we were young, we were coddled, we were fed, we were doted on. And at some point in time in our youth, five, six, seven years old, we started to have this break away from mom and dad loving every single thing that we did. And now all of a sudden there was penalties for things and we got abandoned emotionally, psychologically abandoned and rejected all the way into our adulthood. We figure out ways to get liked and seen by achieving, by, by contorting our personality, by being perfectionistic, by being present by all these different strategies. But at the end of the day, what we all want is for someone to just see us and, and ask us about ourselves and to be able to share what we're struggling with and what we're concerned about and what our fears are and have somebody just listen and say, I hear you. Like you don't need to do much more than that is just hear them and connect with them. They will want another appointment. They don't get enough of that in their life. None of us do. Oh, that's so good. And it ties into a podcast that I listened to recently with Ed Milet and Tony Robbins. And Tony Robbins said in that podcast that the two biggest fears that most people have are number one, 
feeling like they're enough or being enough, right? Pretty enough, smart enough, having enough money, whatever. And that leads into the second biggest fear, or in this case, the actual biggest fear, which is being loved or not being loved. Yep. And I think love is also admired, appreciated, liked, trusted, not just the romantic or familial love. And so it ties very much into this, the psychology of why people walk away from conversations feeling good about it when they did more talking is because in that conversation, they felt like what they were saying was enough for that person that they were having a conversation with, that they felt like I was enough to keep their attention. My life and what I'm doing was enough for them to be interested. And just that little thing right there, if we apply that in different parts of our business, it can, can 10 X our results. Really well said and, and, and a greater deepening of what I shared. So thank you. That's beautiful. And, and yes, it is about being feeling loved and acknowledged. I mean, it, it's a fundamental human need, like I said, and the more that you can give that, the more you truly cultivate relationships with your team as well right now, with your database as well right now. Once we understand what they need and we know what they need right now, they need to know it's going to be okay. Realtors, they're scared. Yeah. This is where having really good market information and being able to articulate it is super important to calm them down, to help them see that we're much closer to the end of this struggle than we are the beginning of it. But what I really want to emphasize to everyone here that's listening to this is taking your role seriously as a financial advisor has never been more important than right now. So re really taking the time to truly educate yourself and to practice delivering a presentation of 10, 15 minutes in length of what's happened with SVB Bank, what's happened with the Fed's rate hikes, what's likely to happen in the future. Most people think recession means real estate tanks, not necessarily. In fact, most of the time recessions mean that real estate actually does well because rates come down. The key thing, Phil, is to be able to articulate that in a very clean way to your realtors. So they then feel confident in moving everybody to you so you can do the selling for them because they're not equipped to make that sell. So as an example, when I first started talking about 2-1 buy downs again, which was in May, and half my clients that are young were like, what are you talking about? What's you're a buy down? Like, <laughs> they're like, you're so old, dude, that program doesn't exist anymore. I'm like, well, guess what? It's coming back. I guarantee you. I was sharing with them, I'm like, there's gonna come a point where this is going to be a necessary sell to your realtors to talk to their sellers about subsidizing this buy down. The thing is, is they're going to feel insecure and inadequate about explaining it because it's not their business. This is a great opportunity for you to then, if you can nail the presentation, if you're my realtor and I'm sharing a program structure, it could be a two on buy down or it could be just what's probably going to happen with real estate and why right now might be a good time to buy or to sell. And I nail the script. Like I really nail it like 10 minutes tight. And you're like, wow, that was really brilliant. And I say, you need to tell this to all your sellers to get them to move, move forward. And if they show any resistance, that's your end. Would you like me to talk to them for you? I'd be more than happy to do that. I want to make the time to be your partner. I can help them see why right now is a good time. We're not where we need to be yet. There's nobody that's going to move from three and a half to six and three quarters or six and a half or wherever rates are at today. But I guarantee you when we get to five and a quarter, which is going to happen, I think probably later on this year, maybe by the end of the summer, maybe even lower, who knows, depends upon how bad this financial crisis ends up being. There are going to be plenty of people that are going to be ready to have that conversation. So be ready to, to deliver it to your realtors because, and to your database, I mean, man, there's a lot to be doing with your database right now. One of the things that you are talking about in this, that example was another one of understanding what your realtor partner needs in that relationship. Cause you ask questions and then delivering them a benefit people on this podcast and that, that consume my content, hear me say all the time, we have a big challenge with talking about features versus benefit. We're very quick to talk about a product, very quick to talk about a feature. And we don't understand that most of the time clients and, and partners aren't putting together what it is we're trying to articulate. So instead, we need to tell a story and show the benefit of what that is. And what you just said right there, 
a lot of people are talking about two one buy downs or even three two one buy downs. Great. How, how does that help me? But when you go and say, listen, you have listings, that, uh, especially, you know, builders with new construction, they don't want to come down on their price. They're, they're willing to offer some incentives. They're willing to offer some concessions. Well, back in the day, that's exactly how we used a 2-1 buy down is you could offer that 2-1 buy down and they still keep that sales price. They still keep that comp in their neighborhood. You've articulated the benefit as opposed to just the feature. And so that's why I love that example so much. Before we get to database though, I want to want to kind of finish this this off in this relationship and and having conversations piece, and I want to talk specifically about mindset. And we've been talking a lot with our clients, with our listeners, around you know habit stacking and understanding that a brain only distinguishes between wins and losses, not necessarily how big they are. And there's a way that you can create that momentum going into those conversations so that you show up the best version of yourself. Like you said earlier, if you put that pressure on yourself, you're not showing up the best version and could potentially botch a great opportunity to create that relationship. I just love to hear from your perspective, what are some things that people can do to make sure they go into those opportunities with the right headspace, with the right mindset? Well, really well said and and, and great question. So I came to an awareness in late September, early October, when things really started to go south. And it affected me, you know, because I worry about my clients. I, they're my friends and, you know, it impacts my business too. I realized, okay, so I've done a lot of, a, a lot of brain research. Like, I, I mean, I, I've been an avid meditator for you know, more than half my life. I know a lot about neuro-linguistic programming, neuroplasticity, and a lot of other brain science information. And I was watching my narrative, my inner narrative. Okay. You know, we have somewhere between... 60 and 80,000 thoughts a day statistically. And so we are constantly running a tape in the background. And that's where meditation could be so incredibly valuable because if you sit quietly and watch your mind, you'll be blown away by all the thoughts that race through it. And I realized, okay, I need to burn a new narrow pathway in my brain very quickly here and develop a mantra that I'm going to not only use myself, but to give to my clients to use. So we had a retreat in Mexico in late October or early November. And when we first sat down, I said, okay, look, from now on, from this day forward, when people, because the trap question is this, hey, how's it going? You get asked that question a lot right now and watch the narrative. Oh man, you know, rates are tough. It's a grind. I'm having to let people go. Okay. That, that is a very powerful narrative that is going to get you to see things through a lens of negativity. And the interesting thing about the brain is the, the, the ego in particular is that the ego seeks to prove itself right because it is a self-preservation mechanism. That's why we have egos. It's ego structure from a psychological perspective is there to, to protect us, to be able to think into the future strategically to make sure that we are safe. And when we formulate a thought and we run that thought and burn a deep neural pathway in our brain, we will look to prove that thought to be correct so we can settle ourselves. That's mechanically how brain science works. So if you're answering that question with a lot of negative responses, then guess what? You're going to look for proof in your world of that negativity. See, there it goes again. The Fed just did it again. See, the stocks are down again. See, you know, another deal I lost. I got, I got, I lost another one to a credit union who has a five one arm. That's a half percent better than my rate. You're going to self-fulfill your own prophecy. Now the inverse is true, which is if you adopt a language that you are disciplined to repeating outwardly and inwardly, you will start to see the world through that lens. So the mantra that we developed was I'm figuring it out. I'm, I'm just figuring it out. How's it going? How's your week? I'm figuring it out, man. Notice the difference in the energy between I'm, I'm just figuring it out. That is an evocation of curiosity and openness. Like I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm looking for new things to do. I'm looking for new ways to strategize. That's very different from, man, it's really hard right now, which is a totally different mindset. The next thing that I'd say, and I'm trying to give you a high level because we could go for a long time on this topic. I have a lot of a lot of content in my arsenal around this subject matter is I, I think everybody needs to be doubling down right now on their morning routine, bro. Like yes. so important, mm. man. I mean, and whatever that is for you, you know, I get asked this question all the time, like, well, what, you know, what's your morning routine and happy to share my morning routine, but I don't know how, I mean, it's just for informational purposes only. You, you should not be 
trying to copy someone else's morning routine. I mean, your morning routine needs to be about what shifts your energy. Yes. What lights you up? What does it for you? Now, there are certain things. Some people will talk themselves into believing do it for them, but I don't believe they do. You know, like reading the news every morning when they, as soon as they wake up, I refuse to believe that that's a good, healthy practice. Definitely not. <laughs> but, but really doubling down on starting your day right energetically, mm -hmm. getting up an hour earlier, going to bed an hour earlier, getting up an hour earlier, having that nice long window to move slow, to think clearly, to set yourself up to go to battle. Yeah. Because that's what the day is right now. Is is it's a battle, and 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 if you're well rested, well hydrated, and clear of thought and mind, and and your emotional temperament is is somewhat even, you're not swinging from one extreme to the next. You have a much greater probability of success from that creative place than you would if you're operating under the hormones of stress, like cortisol and adrenaline and all these things that are not healthy for you. So if for those that are watching this on video, you're seeing me kind of nod like and, and and grin like the Cheshire cat, because this is probably my biggest hot button right now, just because the last year, year and a half, it's changed my life. My morning routine, I'm a night owl by nature. I like to stay up late. I, I've never been a, a morning person per se. And the last, you know, nine months or so I wake up at, you know, it was really five o'clock. Now it's four 30 and I immediately have a routine. I immediately say my affirmations. I go to the gym, I hydrate, create some content that, you know, original quotes that are, that are good headspace stuff. And, and to your point, I've shared my morning routine because people ask about it, but they just need to find their version of the routine. You don't have to get up at a certain time, but get up earlier, go to bed earlier. If I love that you said that in there, cause we talk about this a lot. If you get enough sleep, drink enough water, add a little protein to your diet and move your body for 30 minutes a day, your entire life will change just doing those four things. And if you stack those in the morning, ironically, put some good into your eye gate and ear gate from a podcast like yours, a positive mental attitude book, something where you're feeding your mind, there is a mind body connection. You can't have a positive mindset when you physically feel like crap. That's my personal belief. If you, you know, drank a little too much the night before, you didn't get good rest, you're not hydrating yourself, you're not moving. It's very difficult, in my opinion, to show up as your best self when we're talking about walking in, having an energy where you genuinely want to know someone, you genuinely want to create a relationship with them, you genuinely want to portray abundance and success and a true partnership. I believe and have am yelling this from the, the rooftops for anybody that'll listen. It starts with how you start your day and the, the decision to start your day the right way actually happens the night before the day before there's just Absolutely. so much in there. Absolutely, bro. And the thing is, is that, I mean, this is just basic logic. Like if what we're looking for ultimately is to be attractive to referral partners and to our clients, then isn't it really important for your energy to be vibrating high? Like, I mean, and when I say your energy vibrating high, I mean, that's like something that you can can scientifically measure. It's not just some, you know, woo woo stuff that I'm talking about. I mean, you inherently know it, right? Like there are people who you have in your world that you're just like, man, I don't know what it is about that person. I just love being around them. Like, I, I can't wait to see them again. They're, 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 they're always positive. I always feel better than when I'm with them. And then there are people that, you know, you're like, man, I need to go take a shower right now because <laughs> like this person drains me. Like they are a negativity magnet and you're picking up on their energy. That's what's happening. These people that are in say a downer victim mindset. Okay. Their vibrational frequency is very low and you're, you're picking that up. Okay. And so who's, who's going to be more successful? You know, uh, Tyler Osby, do you know, Tyler? I don't. He's with fairway. Um, and, and he's a very good buddy of mine. His mantra starting December 1st was he had one goal. This is my goal going forward for as long as I need to be. I need to be a beacon of light. Mm -hmm. I will start my day by bringing forward my positive vibe and I need to go out in the world and be a beacon of light to my realtors. I mean, think about how powerful that is. If you're, if you're somebody that they're like, man, I always feel better when I talk to Phil. I can't wait till we have coffee again together. It's not because you sold them on something. That's right. Okay. It's because you actually had something positive to give to them, looping back to the beginning of this conversation. So that it's an inside job. All of this is an inside job. It's all what we're talking about is the relationship with yourself. Yeah. That's what your morning routine is about. And for everybody, again, it can be different. Like, let's do this real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to 
tick off like three or four things that I do in my morning routine, you do the same. And then the listener can get a feel for how they probably are very different. So I start my day by getting up. I, I've learned from Andrew Huberman to not drink coffee for at least two hours before I wake up. Boy, has that made a huge difference, bro. I don't have a crash in the afternoon now and there's science behind why that is. So I start, I drink you know, some tea in the morning. I then sit down and I meditate for anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour. I get done with my meditation. I come upstairs, I stretch sometimes for 10 minutes. Sometimes I'll do a full yoga routine for 30 to 40 minutes. And then I journal and I read a little bit of, of, of positive, you know, passages from a book of uh, an author named Young Pueblo, who is a really brilliant teacher. And then I have my breakfast that and then no, now we're at like 830 in the morning and now I feel good. I'm ready yeah. to go. So what about yours? So I, I, again, I wake up at 430. I immediately drink some water and get hydrated, drink really cold water. I do some affirmations and then I head to the gym. While I'm at the gym, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to Audible. I'm listening to positive stuff while I get a, you know, kind of a treadmill warm up in and get a workout in. While I'm doing that, I'm trying to come up with original thoughts. I do some journaling, but essentially I'll create some original quotes of what's on my mind. I, I want to share some content. I want to put some good, some positivity in, into the world. When I get done with that, I come back and I'll take some quiet time, whether I'm reading, whether I'm in the word, whether I'm, you know, doing some meditation or prayer or whatever. And then by I by the time I clean up and get ready, it's about eight o'clock. So from 4 30 to 8 o'clock, those first three and a half hours of the day are mine. I'm not emailing, I'm not working on my business, I'm not looking at the news, I'm not looking at social media. As far as consuming social media, I may be posting some things. But at that point in time, I'm now golden. I do a protein shake of, of whey protein isolate, so like really good high quality protein. And then when I'm on my way to the office for my first appointment, then I'll drink some coffee. And that few hours has absolutely changed my life because there's a mental, physical, emotional, spiritual aspect to those first few hours. And what I find is when I don't do that, even if it's, I get up at six or six 30, which is earlier than I ever used to get up before my day is different. My energy is different. How I show up my thought process, my ability to go and retrieve answers. So I appreciate you sharing that about your routine because it just goes to show it's not about the specific routine. It's about how do you put a routine together for you? How do you love yourself? How do you honor and respect yourself? That makes it that much easier to go and love and respect other people. And, and I think that that's the part people miss is that they hear this person reads a hundred pages a day. This person gets up at this certain time. This person does so much, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, Josh metal. Well, Josh is the guy that really inspired me moving my wake up time from five, five 30 to like four 30 mm -hmm. is he does his, what his cold plunge. He, you know, walks barefoot outside. He had that, has a whole reel about it. I'm like, Josh can do it. I, I can do it. It was tough. It's not easy to do, but that's why it's such a win in my mind because I don't want to do it. I, I don't like getting up early. Even now I like what happens through that process. And so that's what I really want people to understand is you're not going to love doing every aspect of it. And there may be days that you're like, all right, I'm going to go to the gym, but, but I'm just going to walk on the treadmill. But when you get there, all of a sudden something changes because in your mind, that's a win all those habits start stacking. And by the time you get to that first appointment, I, I would love to be able to measure the energy and the vibrations because it's got to be significantly higher than when you don't. Well, the thing, and, and yes, Josh is very dedicated to his morning routine and he's an inspiration to me as well and a, and a dear friend. The thing that you mentioned that I don't want to skip over for the listener to make sure they pick up on this is if you get up at 6.30, not only are you cutting short your morning routine, but I think that the bigger thing for me at least is that a part of my morning routine is the spaciousness. So by having the spaciousness, I'm not rushing to start my day. And therefore my energy is not frenetic to start my day. We have to understand that when our energy is frenetic and we're and, and stress hormones are kicking in, what happens physiologically is that when we're operating under cortisol and, and endopinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, our focus becomes very narrow, which can be a benefit, of course, if we're working on one project. It's not a benefit if we're trying to think out of the box and create and creatively. So starting the day slow and not being rushed and bringing that more present energy into the day is going to is not only going to give you more chance for success, but it's going to serve you and you're going to feel differently. You mentioned 
earlier and just now you you hit upon it about having wins. Can mm -hmm. I touch upon that for Please, a second? Please, absolutely. I'd love you to impact that. Oh, and before I touch that, let me just say this. Don't be afraid to mix up your morning routine. I do that all the time. Like sometimes I'll just say, you know, I'm going to start doing this instead to create some variety. One of the things that I will do, by the way, people laugh at this, so I'm sure you probably will too, but sometimes as a part of my morning routine, I'll dance. Nice. So like, like I'll, if I'm in my kitchen and when I'm making my coffee, maybe I'll put on some bumping music and get my body moving and just have fun, you know, and maybe sing out loud. I, I, I don't do it when there are people around usually, <laughs> but, but try that on and see how different you feel after you dance to one song and just have a good time before you sit down and drink your coffee. You're like, yeah, all right, let's go, man. Let's, let's get this day started. Part of this whole thing is something you talked about in the first time we had a conversation and I, I think these are the words you use, but you talked about irrevocable promises to self. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really big. And I talk a lot about that and apply that to my life is my morning routine is obviously important, but it's also in honoring and respecting myself because I've made that promise that so that I can show up and achieve these goals so that I can be who I want to be and be who I need to be for other people. This is a promise that I've made that I'm no longer going to do. It's a non-negotiable. And so I appreciate that because that stuck with me and it's something that I still apply to this day. And it's part of those wins that you're you're talking about. You're welcome. And to and to tie that into wins. So here's the thing is that the only relationship you're really ever having is the one with yourself. Okay. And when we break commitments to ourself, we start to not trust ourselves. And that's a very important thing to understand. So there's a process that we take people through and I'll just, it's very short. So I'll give it to you right now. It's like, what agreement did you make? Next question. What did you make more important than, than that agreement? And then finally, what's the consequence of you having broken that agreement? And really looking at that, like taking the time to sit down. Wow. What agreement I make? I made an agreement that I'm gonna do my morning routine. What did I make more important? I made more important having that cocktail or three cocktails last night. What's the consequence of that agreement? I went into my day with frenetic energy and fatigue and a foggy head, and I wasn't at my best in a time when I need to be my best. It starts to put some perspective around the choices that we make. The subject matter of wins is like a really interesting one. You need to build momentum. And a part of that process is to have small victories. And the way in a market like this to create small victories, and this is not my content. So Josh Burris, who is a very good friend of mine, who was on my show in early February, he's the one who, who, who brought this forward. He said, look, we need to change the focus of what a victory is. We need to redefine a victory. In the old model, a victory was, I locked three loans today. That's a setup for failure in today's world. Yeah. Okay. What's the new definition of a successful day? I connected with three people today that are planting the seeds for a huge future for me. There's an interesting thing that I've done some study on recently, Phil, was, and I inherently learned this, which was I used to have a yellow legal pad, which was my time management schedule 25 years ago, and I'd write down what I needed to do today. And whenever I got something accomplished, I'd draw a line through it. And all I remembered was like, when I drew the line through it, it was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I feel pumped, right? At the end of the day, maybe of those 20 things, 20 things, I have 17 of them with a line through it. And I'm looking down at that yellow legal pad and I'm going, good day. Okay. Now, if you don't have some measuring stick to define the achievements that you made in that day, what you're left with is only the things that you didn't get done. Yes. So, if I didn't look down at this yellow legal pad and see 17 things are crossed off and only three are going to get transposed to tomorrow, on my way home from work, I'm going to only be thinking about the three things that I didn't get done and I'm going to be looking through the lens of defeat. It's very, very important psychologically that you set yourself up to be successful and that you celebrate your victories. Yes. And a part of the way that I do that in my morning routine, by the way, to tie, to tie into that is when I journal, I write down th three things every day that I'm grateful for and one thing that I'm proud of, or like today, three things that I'm proud of and one thing that I'm grateful for. Now that might sound arrogant or self-serving, but it's far from it. It's actually really important to acknowledge yourself. We go back to what we said about, we all want to be seen. We all want to be loved. Let's start with how about us seeing ourselves, us loving ourselves. 
us looking at our goodness, that's burning new neural pathways in the brain. This morning I wrote, I'm really proud of the father that I am to my son. I'm really present with him and I really care about what his interests are in his life. I'm really proud of the husband that I am to my wife. I mean, acknowledging yourself as a way of starting your day can be really powerful as well. Ah, oh, it's so good. Tim, I want to be a good steward of your time. I know we wanted to talk about database. So if you would take a second and throw out some 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 tips and some important things as it ties into this conversation, because I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I definitely want to make sure we cover the topic because right now is a huge opportunity for people to be not only leveraging, but creating their database to set themselves up because the market will continue to shift either favorably or unfavorably, but database is probably one of the most important things originators can do long-term in their business. I'm going to focus on one specific thing of many that I could talk about. Your database right now has people in it that want to sell their home. They're just not ready to sell. Do you know what the strike rate is for them to be willing to sell? So here's how the conversation should go. You should be calling everybody in your database and embodying what we talked about at the beginning of this call. You're not calling to sell them on anything. You're calling to connect with them and to get to know them even more deeply and ask them about themselves and understand where you may be able to help them. It may be introducing them to a new accountant. It may be introducing them to a financial planner. It may be telling them about something about parenting because they're a, a new parent, okay, that, that you might have some wisdom and experience to offer them. And then I want you to ask this question. How's your home for you at this point? Tell me about it. Okay. Open-ended question. Ah, you know, it's great. You know, I'm happy here. Blah, 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 blah. Is there anything about your home that you wish were different? Well, you know, I, I do wish that we had a pool. Maybe there's an opportunity for a cash out refi to put a pool in their backyard. Never know. Or, you know, I really wish that we were closer to open space. I'm a trail runner and, you know, it is a bit too urban for me. Or there's another school district that we really wish that our kid was in. Or, okay. Wow. Okay. So have you thought about, Phil, have you thought about maybe listing your home for sale and us looking for another property for you that meets those needs? No, you know, right now, no, I can't. I mean, you got me in a great rate at 3% and rates are at like six and three quarters. And I did the math on an online calculation and just like, there's no way I can afford it. Okay. No problem, Phil. I understand. Now, I'm not going to go into the full length script for the sake of our time, but you need to then say, look, I, I actually think that it's important for me to share some valuable information with you on where I think rates are going and why I think they're going there. And what I want to do is I want to pick a strike rate. Like I need to understand if I'm managing your debt effectively, Phil, and managing your life circumstances effectively, it's important for me to understand what the rate would need to be at for you to be willing to list your home for sale, to go find that home that is backing the open space that's in that school district that has that backyard that could have a swimming pool in it that you define, tying them back into the emotional component. Yes. Okay. Our home is as a place of emotion. I start off by asking the open and question of what's not right about your home or tell me a little bit about your home. What do you wish were different? You divulge to me what your dream home would look like in your current environment in, in, in your life at this time. We're going to address the issue of the financial component. I'm going to educate you on why I think rates are going down. Also, why I think that even if you were to buy right now, it would be a short term loan because I'm very likely to refinance you at some point in time in the next 12 to 18 months. I'm going to anchor back into what you've told me is your dream scenario. And then we are going to run numbers that are going to define the strike rate. And let's say that strike rate is five and a quarter. Okay, Phil, look, after tax, we're going to show the after tax benefits of, of, you know, five and a quarter versus three and a quarter, what you have right now. And we're going to look at the, the delta of, of what you say that you can afford to pay extra, given the fact that you just got a raise or whatever it is. Okay. So what we've defined is that five and a quarter percent is the strike rate. I'm going to watch it for you. And when we get close, I'm going to inform you of it. And then I'm going to introduce you to a real estate agent that I think is outstanding in, in that area that can help you look for property. And we'll explore. So you, know, you don't have to worry about it. Know that I'm going to reach out to you proactively. Right now is a great time to be going into your database, Phil, and understanding the needs of your clients, 
I mean, we could go on and on about cash out refis, debt consolidation. There's so many parts of this conversation. I'm just focusing on one, which is identifying where people may have a need right now as it relates to a different home and what the rate would need to be at for them to want to take action. And then databasing that data, because guess what happens? One day you wake up and rates are at five and a quarter. You run your report and you have seven people to call. I have great news for you. You remember I told you that I was going to be managing this for you and watching it? Here's where we're at. What if two of those seven say they want to move forward and you make two outbound referrals to, to realtors to list their property and pick up two new loans? You know, I mean, there's so many things that we could talk about, but that's one specific tip. That's uh, such a great tip because you're not only adding value to your clients, you're building a funnel, you're building a pipeline, not only of deals for yourself, but for your partners. And that's what a true partnership is. It is, it is a reciprocal relationship. It's an incredible tip. Tim, you, you're always an incredible guest. And I don't want to, to say that lightly because there's so much value in what we talked about today. I know you've got some resources that you're, you're kind of offering some people right now. I'd love you to share those. We'll make sure and put some links in some show notes, but just kind of talk about what you guys are sharing with everybody. This made this really easy for you. What you want to do is you want to go to free. 360tools.com. F-R-E-E, -E, the number three, the number six, the number zero, tools, plural, dot com. And what we have there for you is a couple of different things to download for free. One is a list of 20 open-ended questions that you could be asking real estate partners right now when you sit down and you meet with them for the first time. And the other thing is a copy of my perfect loan process. We didn't get into any specifics on, on that, but man, right now, Phil, every deal that you do has the opportunity to you know, introduce you to a myriad of different additional people. If you cross sell the listing agent correctly, if you cross sell the CPA and the financial planner, and it's a zero sum game, you're either going to create a guaranteed repeat customer who refers business to you or you're not. And that's what your, your loan process could do for you. So both of those provided to your listeners as a result of being on the show. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. If you would throw out uh, social media handle websites, anything else uh, that people can find, I know we can link uh, with the free 360tools.com as well. But if someone wants to contact you directly, just to ask questions, get to know more about what you're doing, where would you send them? For sure. So our company is Performance Experts Coaching, and it's uh, just simply performance dash don't forget the dash experts.com. And then you can find out about our coaching programs. And then of course, the 360 experience podcast, feel free to, to listen to my show as well. We, we do two episodes a month in a long form format and have some really terrific guests. That's awesome. Tim, thank you again. I, I hope this is the first of many more conversations on the podcast and uh, I look forward to catching up again really soon. You got it, buddy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. This is the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast.